All right, well, I want to thank uh, the organizers for uh, the symposium today for their kind invitation to help me come speak with you about integrative medicine and nutritional considerations. I want to start with a definition, definition between alternative and complementary, because there is confusion and uh, they're not the same thing. Um, alternative therapies are promoted for use instead of mainstream treatment for cancer and other serious illnesses. They're uh, usually biologically invasive, expensive, and potentially harmful if for no other reason than <clears throat> they can delay uh, access to appropriate treatment. We all know that the earlier someone presents and, is, and receives the appropriate treatment, the better the outcomes. And so if someone says, well, I'm not going to try traditional things, I'm going to try some quote unquote alternative. In the meanwhile, the cancer continues to grow and multiply. And, and when they finally figure out that what they tried wasn't working, it's at a much more advanced stage and they're at a d disadvantage. The complementary therapies, on the other hand, are used with mainstream care for serious illnesses. They're non-invasive, inexpensive, safe, and most importantly, evidence-based. And we use them mostly for uh, treatment of side effects uh, as opposed to primarily uh, treating the, the uh, underlying malignancy. So in integrative oncology, we use the best of complementary care as well as mainstream care. Okay, the um, major evidence-based complementary modalities include the touch therapies, this is like massage, uh, uh, Reiki, acupressure, mind-body therapies include uh, meditation, guided imagery, rela uh, relaxation, uh, music therapy uh, is used, um, and this is not just listening to music. Um, many of the major cancer centers have music therapy, uh, music therapists, and this is, instead of using talk therapy, uh, they use music, and uh, this is especially beneficial in um, the ICU or um, when patients don't have access to words, end of life, this sort of thing. Because when you use music, you can bypass a lot of the higher cortical functions and really get uh, profound calming effects and very, very beneficial. <clears throat> so they, these therapists use music instead of words to um, do therapy. Uh, acupuncture is beneficial in fitness, uh, both exercise, physical fitness, as well as nutrition. Both of these uh, lead to uh, fitness, and then uh, botanical therapies. The symptoms which are relieved by the complementary therapies are wide and varied and uh, are not only experienced by uh, patients who have uh, cancer, but also, you know, many of, uh, many of us, uh, pain, nausea, fatigue, depression, anxiety, insomnia, constipation or ileus, um, hot flashes, very, very beneficial for acupuncture, dry mouth and xerostomia. Acupuncture is about the only thing that works uh, for that. Um, weakness, dyspnea, shortness of breath, uh, physical deconditioning. Um, one of the handouts that you got uh, earlier this morning was on the benefits of uh, physical fitness and physical deconditioning, you know, really um, leads to a lot of uh, other uh, side effects and complaints and uh, fitness, very important. Uh, lymphedema, acupuncture, again, very beneficial for that, as well as acupuncture is beneficial for uh, neuropathy. <clears throat> Okay, so we'll move on to nutrition. Nutritional considerations basically keep things simple. All right, um, there's a whole lot of diets and recommendations out there, and you know, it's actually dizzying if you think about all the different nutrients and trying to balance this, that, and the other thing. Um, just keep it simple. Serving size, about the size of our fist or a baseball for fruits or vegetables, and size of a deck of cards or the palm of your hand, not including your fingers, for one uh, protein serving. So you want to have three to five servings of fruit per day, plus three to five servings of vegetables per day. And these should be the non, um, non-fatty uh, tubers. So uh, most of the nutritionists don't call a potato a vegetable. That's actually a, 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 a tuber. It's a, a starchy staple, not a vegetable. All right. And so people will say, oh, gosh, I can't have so many fruits. Well, that's like apple, orange, and a banana. You know, that's not so much to have in an entire day. You know, that's not so many fruits. So we can all do this if we work at it. Um, and you want to have about two plus protein meals per day. And you want to think about limiting the red meat and dark meats. Red meats um, are really not that healthy, you know, and um, 
The red meat has a lot of fat. There's multiple uh, reasons why red meat is not, not real healthy. Uh, the dark meat, so this would be like your um, turkey leg or uh, chicken leg, you know, again, because it has much more fat. And also duck, very, very fatty. So probably best not to have that. Um, I'm not saying that anybody needs to be vegetarian, don't hear that, but if we limit the amount of red meat, um, really not more than once or twice a week, and if you never have it, that makes me really the happiest. Um, <laughs> also, uh, the ways of cooking, you, you don't want to grill and barbecue. You know, if we walk through Sears and Home Depot and some of these other places, you'd never realize that grilling and barbecuing is like not that healthy, but it's not. And this is not new news, we just choose to ignore it a lot. You know, they're um, grilling and barbecuing. You can barbecue and grill your vegetables all you want. So your corn, you can barbecue, or the mushrooms if you, you know, the portobello. Um, all of that is fine, but to grill and barbecue the animal protein, and that includes fish, it, uh, the high heat alters the animal protein and turns that into carcinogens. So it's the high heat, number one. Number two, you have the fat that drips down and then it makes the smoke. So smoking also, you know, so like smoked salmon, not healthy. But the smoke it adds another carcinogen, similar to smoking cigarettes. You know, we all know that's bad. So smoking your meats, also not healthy. And then you get the charring. So you overcook it and you get the charring, so all that black stuff, you know. So there's three multiple ways that uh, grilling or barbecuing is not so healthy. Um, if you really insist on grilling and barbecuing, there's ways to make it less toxic, you can't make it non-toxic other than only having grilling and barbecuing your, your vegetables, but you can pre-cook the meats, you can marinate it, and that helps to the meat to soften up a little bit so there's less time on the grill. Um, but that's about it. Or, or you can use shish kebab and have skewers, you know, so smaller quantities of the, the meat along with more of the vegetables that you're uh, grilling and so to have less of it. Uh, so you can, you can do that. But just try and keep things really simple. Um, the, the most, probably the, the easiest um, uh, diet to follow and the one that has the most uh, scientific basis uh, behind the clinical benefits would be the Mediterranean style diet. And that one really has a low amount of red meat and sugar and low amount of saturated fats, you know, and that has, uh, through multiple clinical studies, shown to be really the, the best. And it's also the easy, probably one of the easiest uh, to, to follow. Um, the American Institute of Cancer Research and the American Cancer Research Foundation, uh, they came out with the recommendations. And really, we should stay at a normal weight for most of our life. Being underweight is not good. That um, has a lot of health consequences, including an impaired immune system. But being overweight also is a problem. And um, uh, the uh, U.S. government, they have a, a, a people are, they don't like to call it obese or morbidly obese. They call them overnourished. <laughs> if you're overweight, but actually people who, who are, are uh, overweight can be uh, malnourished because of the way that they are eating, that type of foods that they're eating. But you want to stay pretty much at a normal weight for most of your life, and around 50 to 60 people start gaining weight, and you want to uh, try and limit that amount of weight gain and actually stay at a normal weight. Um, you want to limit the consumption of energy-dense foods. Now, <clears throat> what's in energy-dense foods? These are things that have um, a lot of calories and low nutrients. So things like our um, uh, coffee beverages, the sugary sodas, those kinds of things. A lot of, lot of the, um, the sugar uh, and the energy-dense foods. Um, cakes, candies, frostings, you know, these sorts of things. High fructose corn syrup, try and avoid that if at all costs. Um, and it's, it's hidden in many uh, foods, even in ketchup. You know, there, there's high fructose corn syrup in ketchup, so ketchup doesn't necessarily taste sweet, but there's a lot of sugar in that. Um, when we look at, at a food label, gram of carb, uh, typically, um, or the sugars, Four grams is the equivalent of one package of um, uh, sugar, you know, the white sugar that you make. And <clears throat> it's hidden in a lot of things. Um, when I moved from, I grew up in the Midwest in Minnesota, and there everybody drank coffee black. 
right? And so I moved to New York and it was coffee, regular, it was with cream and two sugars, right? You know, um, so it just, it just tasted sickeningly sweet to me. You know, I couldn't, because I was used to coffee black, right? Um, now, if you look at a can of cola, cola soda, um, there's 39 grams of sugar in a 12 ounce can. So that's equivalent to about 10 packets of sugar. Um, ginger ale has the equivalent of 17 packets of sugar in one can. And we're not even talking about the bigger, you know, the, the plastic things. We're just talking about the regular cans that we have here. So there's a lot of sugar in that. And, and ginger ale doesn't even taste sweet to us, you know, because the, the ginger itself is very bitter. Um, we think nothing of having, you know, cake and ice cream with our can of soda. So we're getting a lot of really energy dense, nutri nutrient poor um, foods. <clears throat> The comfort foods, the, um, the pastas in that, it should be, uh, again, um, cooked al dente, not soft and mushy, but we want to have it be a little bit crunchy in the middle. That way it's uh, uh, less rapidly broken down into the sugars. And um, we want to have five plus non-starchy fruits and vegetables each day. So like I said, three to five fruits, three to five vegetables, but the non-starchy ones. Um, the, so the potatoes, the eddos, those sorts of things, you know, um, you don't want to have those. We want to limit the intake of red meat, like I said. And if you never have it, that actually makes me the happiest. Um, and especially around times of chemotherapy, if you're on chemotherapy, you know, the red meat, it's very hard for the body to digest. Whereas if you have more like, um, even chicken can be difficult. If you have something like the fish, um, that is, is softer, it's more easily broken down by the body. You know, if you have um, red meat, even a piece of uh, chicken, I can sit in your belly for a while and you just don't want to eat and it, it uh, takes a long time for the body to try and digest that. We want to avoid processed meats. So that's like our luncheon meats, our salami, our sausage, um, pepperoni, all of these things, and the smoked meats. You don't really want to ever have that. Once in a blue moon, maybe. Um, how often do blue moons come? Not once a month, not once a week. They're very, very rare. <laughs> okay. We want to limit the amount of salt and avoid moldy grains. Um, when Mayor Bloomberg was in New York, Mayor of, of New York, he was trying to limit, make, make New Yorkers healthy. New Yorkers are pretty healthy because they do a lot of walking and all of that. But uh, still there was a backlash by the Restaurant Association and they wanted to, uh, they were uh, protesting because if you take the salt out of food, it doesn't taste so good, right? You know, where, where if you use low quality food, you add a lot of salt to it, it tastes okay. So anyway, we want to avoid the, the salt. You want to avoid moldy grains. Um, it's not, uh, there's not so much um, the farms here, but in the, um, the uh, further north, uh, when you have the grains that are stored in the uh, silos and they get moldy, that can um, cause some problems with uh, liver cancer, the aflatoxin and, and that. So you want to avoid moldy grains and just you know, look, look at your grains there. We want to exercise most days out of the week. You know, if you can do seven out of seven, that's great. You really don't want any days off for good behavior. You want to have good, healthy habits and seven days out of the week if you can. And at least 30 plus minutes, you can start small and, and gradually increase, but you want about 30 minutes of sustained fitness. And if you're just doing walking, uh, sauntering is not um, okay. I mean, it's okay, but it's not your fitness walk. Your fitness walk is about 100 steps a minute. So for most of us, if you're walking and carrying on a conversation, you're not doing a fitness walk. I mean, it's helpful and you're getting some osteoporosis prevention because of the, the, um, the stress on your bones from walking, but you really want to do a good fitness walk, which is about 100 steps a minute, and um, that's probably pretty close to what mo most New Yorkers do <laughs> normally, but uh, really, you want to, you know, time it and do nice, you know, good walk, and then you can, you can add the arms for upper, upper body work as well, but really very, very important. <clears throat> And then you want to limit the amount of alcohol. Uh, less than two drinks a day for men and less than one a day for women. And 
for many uh, of the cancers, uh, regular alcohol use is a risk factor for recurrence and a risk factor for the cancer itself. There's other ways to be heart healthy other than having a glass of red wine a day, you know, and actually, um, if, especially if people smoke or they have smoked, the, uh, the com combination of the alcohol with the tobacco is a, a carcinogen and that is more and more being recognized. So, you know, you don't really want to be having a drink. And, and I'm not talking about like, you know, one drink is not like a really big drink. You want to have like one ounce, okay. Okay, so what about preventing weight loss? Um, you really, well, it's a little bit depend, dependent on if you have a stomach or if you don't have a stomach or how much of a stomach you do have. If you have a partial gastrectomy, full gastrectomy, you want to do multiple small feedings. Don't think of, of three big meals, three boluses of, of nutrition, you know, kind of like the animals graze continuously. You, if you can do that, that would be best. Um, every, think about every two hours having multiple small feedings. And you want to really increase the good fats, oils, and nuts. Um, you want to do this more judiciously if you don't have a stomach. A stomach uh, will be a buffer to our body for any kind of bad behavior that we have. Whereas if you have uh, no stomach or only part of a stomach, you're much more uh, prone to more immediate uh, uh, effects of what you are eating. So if you're eating a lot of fried, fatty, you know, um, processed foods, you're not going to feel real well almost immediately if you don't have a stomach or if you have less of a stomach. If somebody has a whole stomach, then it, there's a bit of a buffer, you know, where some of that gets digested. Yes, but um, you want to increase the good fats and uh, not just eat junk food. Don't do that. Um, add coconut oil into your food. So coconut oil is the medium chain triglycerides. These are, are really very healthy, um, and it's, it's different than your, your saturated uh, fully, well, it's, it's the triglycerides. It's uh, different than your um, saturated fats. You want to have more complex carbohydrates, so less of like the white flour, um, more complex carbs, like the 100% whole grain, or what I really love is quinoa because the quinoa has a complete protein and it's very easy on your, di your digestive system. So you can absorb it even if you don't have um, a, a full stomach, can do that. And it's, it's nutrient dense as opposed to uh, nutrient poor. Uh, think about drinking your calories rather than eating mostly solid foods. Um, the, the body absorbs liquids much faster than it does solids uh, because it doesn't have to work as hard to, to digest. So if you have like the smoothies, uh, things, um, and I had mentioned before about avoiding the animal meats, uh, especially, you know, like a big piece of steak. If you're going to have solid foods and you're, you're having trouble about weight loss, think about chewing your food properly because we have digestive enzymes in our saliva. Most people will take a bite, they'll chew two, three times, and then swallow. Well, that doesn't really cut it, especially if you don't have a stomach or if you have part of a stomach, you really want to chew your food 20 to 30 times because the chewing will help to break down the food and it helps to, to start that digestive process going even in the mouth. And so then by the time the food reaches the stomach or whatever uh, amount of stomach you have or the intestines, it's actually mushy and um, partially digested. So it aids your digestion if you do chew your food properly. And so chew, you know, there's nothing wrong with chewing. We don't do it. We're in a hurry to eat and we, but uh, really it, it uh, will improve your nutrition significantly. Um, also consider the plant forms of protein, like I said, you know, the, the quinoa, um, the legumes are an excellent source of protein. They also have the, the complex carbo uh, carbohydrates, uh, the soluble uh, um, carbohydrates. So it helps to keep the bowels regular. Uh, lentils, I, w I love lentils because when you cook them, they're soft and mushy and they just sort of disintegrate. And, it, and so it, 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 it's very easy um, on, your, on your body and they're uh, easily digestible. Whereas some of the other beans, like the kidney beans, the red beans, you know, those are, are much more firm and, and um, so can be a little bit more problematic. But the, the lentils, split peas, chickpeas, these things, excellent. You want to consider dairy. Um, dairy gets a bad rap, but I prefer the full fat as opposed to the low fat. You really want to have full fat or, or 2%, mm -hmm. um, but not low fat. 
um, dairy. And yogurt is excellent, especially the Greek forms of yogurt. The, um, and the kefir has uh, probiotics. So your, your yogurt um, has the probiotics. People even who are lactase intolerant will typically uh, be able to take yogurt just fine because the milk sugar is broken down by the bacteria in the process of making the yogurt when it's being fermented. Um, some of these other drinks, like the kombucha, they, when they're fermented, they actually form alcohol. So you have to be a little careful with that, um, the kombucha drinks. But um, that. And increase the omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, salmon, excellent. Um, also, uh, Arctic char is like a second cousin to a salmon. It's more popular up on the northeast coast. But uh, Arctic char and salmon, wonderful. If you could have that two to three times a week, that would be excellent. Um, walnuts, excellent source of omega-3, as are chia, chia seeds. Again, um, so how about dietary supplements? Um, if you're eating a healthy diet, we shouldn't need to supplement too much. Uh, vitamin D is, is the one exception because we really don't get enough vitamin D from our food and then um, we're not really recommending un unprotected sun exposure. We get most of our vitamin D from the sun. There's not much in food. Um, so most of us do need a vitamin D supplement. Um, the question is how much you want to have a blood level, probably of at least 40 nanograms per mil. Um, especially as we get older, vitamin D deficiency can cause some gait abnormalities and falls, and the data clearly indicates that a level of at least 40 nanograms per mil will help to prevent falls. And uh, so it also is an immunomodulator, so that's good. Um, B12 as well. Um, once we hit the age of 50, we're less efficient at absorbing the B12 from our food, so most of us will need a B12 supplement. Um, you can either get monthly injections or I prefer the sublingual form on a daily basis. Because again, if it's just a pill and you swallow it, if you don't have the terminal ileum, um, you may not absorb uh, the B12. And also metformin increase, decreases our B12 absorption. So if you're on metformin, you probably need, um, you may need the monthly injections. Okay, or substitution, okay. You don't want to um, be taking uh, so much uh, supplements and think of that as, as uh, well, I'm taking all these supplements, so therefore I don't need to eat food. It isn't like that. You also need to be careful of some of these fad diets because when you eliminate multiple food groups, you are nutritionally deficient. And then how do they make it so that you aren't gonna get toxic? Then they add in a back a bunch of supplements. So if you are on this massive supplement regimen, you wanna be a little careful with that, and kind of be suspect. Um, but supplements can be um, beneficial, and there's a lot of research into using some of the different botanical compounds, especially some of the medicinal mushrooms as immunomodulators uh, in combination with chemotherapy. would never recommend doing that alone. Um, when you look at parts of China where they only have access to the herbal medications and don't have access to Western medicine, the, the clinical outcomes for cancer are not nowhere near like they are when you have access to the Western medicine. But again, in complementary therapy, you want to combine these two. So again, it may be beneficial using some of the um, botanical products, but they need to be judiciously um, done and in combination with a good integrative oncologist. Okay, so our USP label, you know, uh, in 1994, there was the DSHEA Act, the Dietary Health Supplement Education Act, and this took the realm of, of dietary supplements out from the FDA. And um, so uh, things are on, available on the market. You used to have to go to a health food store to get supplements, right? Now you can just find them in the gas station. You get these energy drinks, you get all sorts of things. I mean, so it's like everywhere. and. Um, what we don't realize is that there, there's no one regulating because the FDA since 1994 is no longer rec regulating these things, unlike drugs. So you don't know whether it's safe or effective or even what's in there is what's on the bottle. And there was a problem uh, last within the last year, many of the uh, supplements from some of the major um, companies were removed from the market because they had nothing in there, They're none of the active ingredient. So. About 5% of the supplement manufacturers will send their product to two different companies. Uh, one is the USP, the United States Pharmacopeia. The other is clinical laboratories. And so if you look, let's see. Uh, oh, I can't, uh, you can. oh, right there, okay. 
right there. That's the USP logo. So if you see that on the bottle, then that will show you, tell you that they sent their, their product to the U US Pharmacopeia. Now this is a marker that they used, um, that what's in the bottle is the same thing that's on the label and nothing extra, that they use good manufacturing processes and that you know um, it's tested for bioavailability, screened for harmful contents, that it's, it's, you're, it's quality control. Talks nothing about clinical efficacy. It doesn't say if it's gonna work, it's just, quality control, you're getting a high quality product. And um, that in and of itself is, is important, but that doesn't mean that if you take it, it's gonna work for whatever you're trying to take it for. Um, okay, the next one is clinical laboratories. So if you look here, you'll see the little Erlenmeyer flask and then it'll on the bottom say, you know, the name of the, the product, if it's um, ginkgo biloba or echinacea or whatever it is. And again, either one of those two um, logos, and that will tell you about quality control. Um, the, um, yeah, I, I won't name names. Okay, so we'll just <laughs> leave it at that. Okay, food fads and myths. Okay, is it really sugar feeds cancer? No, if it were only that simple, right? No, sugar feeds cells, uh, cancers as well as otherwise. Um, some of the cancer cells cannot utilize non-glucose forms of uh, energy. So what's been popularized recently is something like the uh, ketogenic diet or low-carb diets. You'll read about that a lot. Um, and that has some bearing, especially, especially beneficial in uh, pediatric seizure disorder. That's been used for decades, the, the um, uh, ketogenic diet, but uh, brain cancer would make sense because um, you have the blood-brain barrier. But actually in some of these other cancers, limiting carbs and limiting sugars is uh, helpful. Um, there's been some sort of variation on this theme where people will do uh, prolonged fasting, maybe skipping dinner, do 12 to 15 hours of non-eating non along with then just say during the daytime have you know their, their calorie ingestion. And again, trying to uh, induce more of a fasting or a ketogenic state. Um, people have cut out fruits because fruits have sugars. You don't want to do that. You know, you'd, anytime you cut out major food groups, you know, you're going to end up with nutritional deficiencies. There are some vitamins and minerals that we can only get from eating fruit, just like you can, you know. So you need to have a, a nice balance and, and not too much of any one thing and, and not, not go too crazy on any one thing either. Um, but uh, just... You don't want to have too much of the sugar and really never any of the high fructose corn syrup. And I'm not too fond of these artificial sweeteners either. Um, Splenda changes our brain and makes us crave sweet. And many of the diet sodas, the components in that, they actually uh, change our brain and then we don't get that sense of satiety or that sense of fullness. So people actually overeat just um, because it changes our brain. And we don't get that, the, the ghrelin uh, or leptin, which tells us that we're full. And so it alters our insulin sensitivity as well. Okay, detoxing. This is a meaningless buzzword. Um, our body can detox things just fine. Our liver is our body's biochemist and our kidneys also uh, work on um, uh, eliminating many toxins. Most people, if they're doing uh, these detox programs, they're doing you know, either intermittent fasting or they're taking juices and they're eliminating the high solid fat, high carb foods. And if you do that, you eat healthier for a few days, you will feel better just because you're eliminating all of this bad stuff that we often eat in the, the typical Western diet. So that you don't wanna, you really don't have to detox. You don't wanna take a bunch of supplements and do all this other stuff. If you just eat healthy on a daily basis, allow the body to do its work, you'll be fine. And you don't wanna get rid of your chemo earlier, right? The, you're taking chemo, your oncologist is giving you your chemo to uh, treat the cancer and you don't wanna get rid of it earlier and detox to get rid of the chemo. Just let, you know, that makes no sense at all. So just try and eat healthy, these things. Um, what about the paleo diet? Okay, well the paleo uh, is based on early humans and it uh, takes a lot of fish, uh, meat, vegetables, and fruit. So there's, it excludes all dairy products, all grains, processed foods, potatoes, and salt. So um, 
you have some healthy components in there, but you don't, um, you need dairy and you need some grains too. So you end up with nutrient gaps um, by B, B vitamins, calcium, it's calcium deficient, it's also vitamin D deficient. So it, this is not, um, you don't wanna do the pure paleo diet. Um, you know, you can, you can just eliminate, um, you know, the processed foods and potatoes and salt in and of itself and not have to say that you're going paleo. Also, if you're, Following a paleo diet, it's impossible to do if you're vegetarian because it, it eliminates all of your non-animal forms of protein. So it's m markedly nutritionally deficient. So really not, not um, recommended for most people on a long-term basis. <clears throat> all right, so uh, raw foods. Um, this, there are some benefits to eating raw foods, not, but you don't have to eat only raw foods. Uh, US News and World Report ranked the raw food diet number 34 out of 38 possible ones as far as easy to adhere to. So it was really not easy to adhere to um, at all. And um, it's based on this thought that if you cook foods above 100 and some degrees, then you're breaking down the nutrients, and that's just incorrect. It's just wrong. Um, you can have more fruits and vegetables and have more raw foods. Most people lose weight on a raw food diet because they're consuming less calories than they would if it were cooked. But uh, especially if you're on chemo, having a lot of raw food, if you don't have a, a, a full stomach, uh, these things are not tolerated very well. So it's really, you know, it's a food fad. Um, juicing. Juicing can be beneficial. I, I prefer uh, actually using a blender to using a juicer. T typically, you know, you put food in and then the juice comes out, the liquid comes out on one and all the pulp and fiber comes out the other end and then near, near the two shall meet again. So you're, get, you're concentrating nutrients, but you're also getting high bolus of, of sugars, all the sugars in the fruits, and you're not getting any of the protein or, or the other components which are beneficial, so you get this bolus of glucose into your system, and then you get a, a massive secretion of insulin, and insulin drives a lot of these growth factors, so it can be problematic to do the juicing. I like blenders, if you're um, pureeing your foods, you know, and you're getting the whole fruit and the whole vegetable, and you're pureeing it, and so you're getting the pulp and the fiber and all of that, that is fine, that's much better for you than just uh, juicing. Okay, Gerson therapy. This is a, an unproven cancer treatment. It was um, uh, promoted by Max Gerson. He was a German physician in the, in the 1850s. He died in 1959 in New York. And his thought was that it was all about removing fat from the diet. So it's plant-based, raw juices. They also use coffee enemas. They, and uh, Max Gerson himself uh, gave people calf liver juice which you know, they don't do now, but it's very high in vitamin A. The liver stores uh, vitamin A, so you can get really toxic using these things. So people eat about 15 to 20 pounds of uh, fruit and vegetables a day. The only way to do that is to juice it, and so then they're, getting, they're not getting any of the pulp or the fiber, so this leads to a lot of nutrient uh, deficiencies. Uh, so uh, not recommended, it's not, doesn't, doesn't treat the cancer and it's not, not nutritionally sound. Um, Budwig diet, sometimes called the Bill Henderson protocol. Again, this is um, a bogus treatment. Um, this was uh, designed by Joanna Budwig in the 1950s, another German um, uh, physician. She uses a lot of flaxseed oil and cottage cheese along with vegetables and fruits and juices. Uh, avoids a lot of processed foods, meats, um, and sugars. So you're avoiding some of the bad things, but again, you know, high amounts, it's, it was based on uh, the theory that cancer is caused by a polyunsaturated fatty acid deficiency. And so taking high amounts of flaxseed oil with cottage cheese is going to uh, replete this and, and cure you, which uh, isn't, isn't so. And depending on your type of cancer, it can be really detrimental. Um, but there's no clinical, uh, large-scale clinical trials which are using this. It's just not, not advised. So, uh, no, don't do that. <laughs> okay. All right, so our, our source of uh, reference, good solid reference for complementary medicine at the National Institute of Health, we've got the uh, OCAM, Office of Cancer, Complementary and Alternative Medicine cancer.gov slash CAM, and the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, NCAM, and the Office of Dietary Supplements, the odh.nih.gov, and they have 
you know, good uh, source of, of things. Also, American Cancer Society has some excellent um, monographs on their uh, website as well. Um, Sloan Kettering, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center has a world-renowned uh, uh, program, and they have a website, and it's an app also that's available on iPhone that's free. You can download. Um, it's MSKCC org slash about herbs and there's multiple monographs on this uh, on many of the different supplements and um, uh, vitamins and some of the other therapies as well very very high quality uh, thing there's two portals one for the healthcare professional and the other for the consumer and you can go back and forth the one for the healthcare professional actually has links to live abstracts so it's wonderful if you want to read the, the data the studies behind the uh, recommendations all right, so our summary, the integrative therapies assist with uh, many symptoms uh, patients experience and are very, very beneficial, useful at all stages of the, the cancer uh, continuum. Uh, acupuncture is very beneficial and uh, can do that uh, once a week. Uh, usually, if, if we time it with chemo, it's two to three days prior to the chemo. Um, massage, reflexology, Reiki, very, very beneficial, the touch therapies, and, and the, the benefits persist up to a week uh, past uh, the treatment. So um, very, very beneficial. Our mind-body therapies, again, uh, very beneficial. Daily nutrition, very important. We think about, you know, doing, eating well um, and exercise on a daily basis, no days off for good behavior. <laughs> and herbs and botanical supplements can be beneficial, but they're not for everyone. You can see um, uh, someone who can help you to pick and choose what may be beneficial with your treatment regimen. And if your regimen changes, your recommendations may change as well. Okay? So I want to thank you all for your time and attention. And if we have questions, time for questions yeah. we have? Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, actually, we're running out of time, but okay. we have a lot of questions that came online. And I'd like to call the rest of our speakers up. And while they're coming up, I'll ask you some questions. Okay, Howard. sure. Um, let's see. Uh, it says, question for Dr. Boesso. What is her opinion on integrating alternative medicines like homeopathy and Ayurvedic, meaning Indian herbal medicines, with chemotherapy? Okay, integrating alternative therapies. I, well, I don't, I don't like the term alternative. Um, homeopathy um, is uh, interesting. The premise is that the more dilute something is, the more potent it, effect it has on the body, which goes against uh, basic science. So things that are more potent from a homeopathic uh, perspective have almost no molecular ingredient in there. So the chances of having adverse consequences from this, uh, combining it with chemotherapy is, uh, you know, so next to zero. So the homeopathy should be safe. Um, Ayurveda is interesting. Um, it has its own, uh, many of the Ayurvedic compounds, you know, from India, they use, intentionally put lead and um, other heavy metals in there. Um, so you have to be very careful. Um, lead arsenic, um, these things. So I would be very careful about using any of the uh, preparations that you use orally. Uh, some of the dietary recommendations are fine. Some of the, um, the oil therapies that they use, the massage that they use in Ayurveda, that is, that is fine. That's not going to be difficult. Um, some of the sauna therapies and other heat therapies I would be careful of because you can end up with, if you end up with dehydration, then you can actually concentrate some of the toxins, the chemotherapy things in your bloodstream and end up with more difficulty um, from side effects from that. But um, use judiciously and not taking the, um, the oral products, I think it okay. would be fine. Great, thank you. We're gonna continue the questions. So why don't we um, get our panel together. What I do wanna do is, uh, is introduce you back uh, to Debbie, who would want to say some final words, and then we're gonna continue with questions from our panel. Debbie? Thank you. So this does not conclude our session, even though we are going over. We are going to still offer the wonderful panel and the questions because that has seemed to be something everyone is very interested in. So I'm just going to interject for just a minute to offer my thanks to everyone who has joined us today in person and via webinar, um, our speakers, panelists, our sponsors. A great event would not be possible without great leadership. I would like to take a moment to recognize our moderator, Dr. Libya Scheller, who expertly conducts a terrific meeting. Thank you, Libya, for your work to make today a success, and I have a little something for you. Oh. 
little plaque of our appreciation for Dr. Libya Scheller. Thank you. So although Peter Sprague, the committee chair, was not on the stage very long today, um, he gave a brief talk this morning, I want to recognize his tireless work and planning as the committee chair. He is truly remarkable. He gives of himself just selfishly um, all year long. So thank you, Pete. Please come up. Thank you for your leadership and dedication. I'm presenting him with this plaque for appreciation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry to interject that in the middle, but I'm going to turn you back over to our wonderful moderator and our speakers. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. What a sweetheart. Thank you. You know, I, I think all of you guys realize this is more like a, and somebody mentioned to me earlier, a very special friend, that this is like a family than an organization, um, but it's both. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm going to open it up to questions on the floor, and then I have some online. So do we have any questions for Dr. Wessa? On, okay, we have a question in the back. Uh, versus, um, you know, normal chemo chemotherapy with uh, Chinese botanical. What do you interject about that? Uh, the question is: Is it appropriate to combine uh, normal chemotherapy with some of the Chinese herbal medications? It is possible, but it depends on what your chemotherapy is and what the um, the herbal medication would be. I wouldn't say just go to an herbalist and, and uh, do that. You need to work with an excellent integrative medicine physician who understands the complexity of the herbs. The Chinese herbs, actually, they don't use just one. They usually use at least five, if not seven to 10 in combination uh, because they work from the theory of traditional Chinese medicine, they work with each other. So you really need to be careful. Um, you know, what you're using and making sure that it doesn't uh, interact adversely um, with your uh, main chemotherapy because many of the herbs can alter drug levels. They can make your uh, metabol the drug metabolism be either slower or faster. So you either get too much chemotherapy or not enough, neither of which is desirable. So, you know, if you have too much, then you get more toxicity and side effects and may not tolerate your regimen that's as intended. Or if it um, metabolizes it faster, you're not getting enough drug, and so it's not going to be as effective. So it is possible, but it depends on the, the components used in the, the chemo. So it needs to be done very carefully and judiciously. Don't do that by yourself for any. Yeah, not, OK. We have a question online about the medicinal mushrooms that you mess, um, that you mentioned. It says, what botanical products, uh, medicinal mushrooms, what, where can you get them, which ones, what are your thoughts on daily intake of also turmeric and um, astragalus? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, the questions on the medicinal mushrooms, it's, it's complicated. I can't give overall recommendations in a symposium because it's very uh, dependent on what, what your cancer is, what your chemotherapy is, and um, whether you're getting radiation or not and all of that. Um, the active it, it, mushrooms are immunomodulators, and so they do work by um, affecting the immune system. And as we know, you can either um, put your foot on the gas pedal or on the brake. So depending on what the constituents are, and all the mushrooms are very different, depending on their constituency, they ca carry the beta-glucans, which um, do uh, induce um, a lot of uh, neutrophil and um, uh, function. Uh, we've had. There's multiple clinical trials looking at uh, the different medicinal mushrooms in um, the setting in combination with chemotherapy. I'm not going to uh, give uh, 
names and you know take this and that because um, it needs to be done in conjunction with your medical oncologist and with a good integrative um, uh, medicine uh, physician to make sure that you are not um, uh, count, counteracting your chemotherapy or with the radiation. Astragalus has been uh, studied primarily in lung cancer. Um, it also has the saponins, uh, which are immunomodulators. Saponins are things like the, the soap, you know, so it helps, uh, uh, the saponins are in, in your dishwashing soap, you know, that's what uh, dissolves the, the grease and things. So um, it, it has some effect into uh, increased uh, uh, cell wall permeation and things, but uh, primarily the astragalus is for uh, lung cancer. And um, the, uh, um, what was the other one, the, the mushrooms? Oh, turmeric. Oh, the turmeric. Yeah, that's really popular. Uh, the turmeric, you have to be careful of it. It is anti-inflammatory, but it alters the P450 system. So if you are on chemotherapy uh, that is metabolized using the P450 system, you can end up with increased metabolism of your chemo and not get enough of the drug. It also is an antioxidant. It's pretty um, you, you, high level of antioxidants, so you want to be careful using that in conjunction with radiation. Radiation works solely through an oxidative process, so if you're getting your radiation and then you're taking these other things, you're canceling each other out, and you don't want to be doing that. Um, so it, 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 it it's complicated, and it gets complicated very quickly. But they can be used in the right setting in the right patient. Um, but again, it needs to be done in conjunction with a, a good integrative oncologist. Okay. You have a question here? Yeah, you mentioned that uh, you preferred uh, not having the non-fat milk for dairy, and I wondered why that was. Okay. The. Um, we need fat. Uh, you know, there's this country uh, for the last few decades has been on the low fat uh, bandwagon, and that. Uh, actually is, is not so beneficial. We need fat. Um, there's healthy fats. Um, the, the, um, the trans fats and things are not, not healthy, but you need some of the saturated fats in order to make um, uh, hormones like cholesterol and some of the other uh, steroid hormones and um, neurotransmitters that we, we need. So we need that from fat. Also, uh, some of the, um, uh, the medium chain triglycerides are very healthy and they actually are anti-inflammatory and, and may have a role um, in uh, uh, decreasing progression of uh, cancer growth. Uh, having said that, that doesn't mean that we should eat massive quantities of, of these things. But, but uh, for dairy, you know, uh, vitamin D has been added to milk. Okay. Um, vitamin D is fat soluble. So if you have non-fat milk and you're taking, taking it, they add vitamin D, you, you're not going to absorb it. Right? So that's the biggest myth. Plus, um, when you take fat out of food, the low-fat foods, they, they taste bad. All right. And so then they typically add a lot of other things to the, um, to the foods in order to make them palatable. And what do they add? They add sugar and refined carbohydrates, typically. So a lot of the low-fat things are really not healthy. You're better off having a small amount of full-fat food that is natural. Then because when they take the fat out of things, it alters the chemical constituents. And uh, skim milk is just really, you know, there's not much in, in there. You would be much better off having the full fat, which is only 4%. It's not like it's 100%. It's 4% is full fat milk. Um, it's standardized. Uh, most cows, the milk straight from the cow is about 5% fat. Uh, depending on the, the diet, but you know, f full fat is four percent. Two percent is okay if you have, you know, high cholesterol. But you'd be better off having the, the full fat milk, getting the satiety and the and the good benefits from from that product, uh, rather than having your skim milk, which really doesn't doesn't taste good, and it doesn't. Y you're missing out on some of the benefits to um, to the dairy product with the, the fat. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, another question online, has there been or are there any active studies of the use of cannabis, meaning oil, smoking pills? Can studies using cannabis? Yes. Um, in the oncology setting, I am, um, high quality studies, no. Um, the, 
we've been using Marinol um, uh, for a long period of time in um, the oncology setting as an appetite stimulant, and that is available um, as a prescription. Using cannabis itself, um, that I think it has its own agenda and is problematic. And when you look at the states where um, uh, medical marijuana is legal, um, that has its own uh, set of problems. And there's a lot of toxicity associated with that and with uh, with the ingestion and the smoking. And you're talking about you know standardization and all of the, that has its own set of problems. Um, but uh, using the uh, Marinol it, uh, is well recognized as uh, uh, being uh, uh, beneficial for decreasing nausea and um, this. Uh, there's, uh, the American Society of Addiction Medicine also is not in much favor of uh, using the um, uh, regular uh, medical marijuana and using those products. Again, it's, it's like any other botanical product. You have a problem with standardization and quality control and things unless things are grown in a warehouse, um, a greenhouse where all things are, are uh, controlled, there's batch to batch variability. So you can't be assured that, um, you know, your, your study uh, is, is valid unless you have things that are grown in um, a good uh, greenhouse, so no. <laughs> Roundabout answer to say no. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to open the floor to any question you may have for our panelists here. <clears throat> any questions from the audience? We have someone in the back. Um, yeah, so this is for um, Kathleen. Maybe you could answer it, but also I want to open it up to the rest of the panel. Um, what's your take on probiotics? So the gut microbiome is, is going to be something that's going to be of interest, I think, with relationship to gastric cancer. And I think uh, when we're studying cancer, we need to f not forget that there are other components of cancer that we need to take in consideration. Immune system is obviously really important, and we're seeing that today, but also um, the gut and the bacteria in the gut. And so how, you know, using probiotics or um, therapies to replace bacteria, um, how do you think that's going to affect gastric cancer patients? Okay, that's an excellent question uh, about using probiotics. Um, we're not there yet where we can really recommend. Uh, the question is, is how much, which bacterial strains to use, in what setting, how frequently, um, how, you know, is it 10 billion, is it 50 billion, is it 100 billion? I mean, you know, if you go out to the drugstore and you can find all sorts of different variations on that theme. Um, there has been research in uh, looking at gut bacteria um, in, the setting of um, Equal and uh, some of the, the uh, programs for um, uh, menopause and estrogen production, and um, certainly, you know, the women who are Equal producers may have better response to soy-based products and all of that because, again, it depends on their bacteria, the bifidobacteria versus other bacteria. So there's a lot of interest into this area. Um, certainly the gut, uh, you know, when I was in medical school, they said, well, the gut has these Peyer's patches, which are, you know, lymph nodes, but they're not really used for anything. Okay, well, we know that that's probably not accurate now, but, um, you know, what can it do um, that... Uh, it probably does play a role, and there have been um, some instances where they do like fecal transplants, where they, you know, um, just give, you know, the bacteria capsules, you know, to uh, people. And it has a role also in um, fat absorption and in and metabolism. But there's a lot of interest in in this, and I think that um, down the road we probably will have more. Um, uh, information clinically for us. Um, I, I think it's it's a definitely a, a promising area uh, for research and and but we I, I can't tell you which strain how many do you need at least 10 do you need at least three I mean depending on who you talk to you know you walk into the vitamin shops and they'll tell you you need the most expensive one you know um, but that's not necessarily you know, the case. There was one, a number of years ago, there was one very strong um, clinical trial that looked at 
and they used some probiotics in the setting of uh, acute pancreatitis, and these were ICU patients um, who, you know, when you have acute pancreatitis, you're very sick, you're in the ICU, you get a lot of antibiotics, and so it made sense to use the probiotics. In that group, the, the probiotic group actually had worse survival, a longer ICU stays and worse survival because they had translocation, the bacteria went from their gut into their bloodstream and they had bacteremia. So you have to be careful of the setting and um, do it in a uh, appropriate manner. And we need appropriate clinical studies and things. But I think down the road, we're gonna be doing much more of this, adding that in conjunction. Yeah. Another interesting area is the whole question of digestive enzymes. Do we need them or not? Yeah, so, yeah. okay. I'll, I'll, um, I'll just point out I'm in far from an expert here, but there were a few prominent studies within the last year <clears throat> arguing that the, the gut microbiome, the presence of different bacteria, can have some influence on the response to certain uh, immunotherapies. This is very, very early days. I know there are a lot of new biotech companies starting to work around this idea of can you sort of shape the, the <laughs> microenvironment in a way that might promote the success of immunotherapy. So this is clearly, I think the there is a crosstalk between the microbiome and the immune system. Uh, this is something people are actively looking to try to manipulate, but um, again, very early days. Any other questions? Um, this is for Dr. Ilson. You, when you had your presentation, you mentioned um, in the second line of uh, clinical studies uh, that uh, HER2 with alternative studies. What particular alternative studies were you referring to? Is it? Uh, well, I didn't mean that alternative medicines. I just said the, the, what, what's coming up in the field and studies. And we, we reviewed. Uh, the pertuzumab study, which we should get results hopefully in the next year or so uh, for, for initial treatment, that we should think about whether or not adding pertuzumab to, to Herceptin makes improvements. In terms of second line trials, we got negative results for uh, TDM1, uh, which was the uh, tristuzumab estimancine drug, which is approved in breast cancer, was not helpful. We also got negative results for lapatinib. Um, in first line, which didn't show that it was beneficial. Um, and there are some other, other uh, new drugs being studied, but right now the one that we're really waiting for is pertuzumab and also the uh, applying uh, uh, Herceptin in uh, the surgical setting and in the radiation setting. But I, I, did, I didn't mean that there were alternative, you know, <laughs> bot bot botanicals or herbs to uh, target the HER2 pathway. Maybe Dr. Wessa can clarify that. Yeah. No, I'm not a aware of anything uh, specific that you can add uh, like that. Um, okay, so. Yeah. Um, not, not specific for the HER2, yeah. Okay, so staying on that same theme about HER2, what HER2 score is considered HER2 positive, and can a cancer convert to HER2 positive over time, Dr. Ilson? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, so for HER2 testing, we, we typically do just pathology staining. That's probably the quickest and easiest. So the pathologist will do tissue staining with an antibody. And if the tissue is uh, scored as three plus, uh, that's considered positive. The, the score goes uh, zero, one, two, three. So if it's scored three plus, that's positive, and that patient would be HER2 positive. If the staining is two plus, uh, that's thought to be equivocal, and those are, that means it's not, it could be positive or negative, so in that situation, we would do the fish testing, that's where they do the staining, and they can count the gene copy number. So initially, you would do the immunostaining, if it's three plus, you're positive. If you do immunostaining and it's two plus, then that's considered equivocal, it's not clear, then you do the, the, the gene copy counting with fish testing. If it's zero to one plus, that's considered negative. So, so we don't tend to do any additional testing. And we remember that uh, for gastric cancer, the positivity rate's about tw uh, 10 to 20%. Uh, 
I don't think I've heard of a situation of any patients becoming HER2 positive. I think it's always pos uh, possible. We're more concerned that patients convert to HER2 negative, actually. Uh, patients that get initial HER2 targeted therapies, and then we do another biopsy if the tumor's progressing. Uh, up to 20% uh, of patients may actually lo lose the HER2 status, may become HER2 negative. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, patients becoming HER2 positive. I mean, Adam, you, you have heard of such cases. I mean, I, mean, I think it's possible, but nothing I've heard of. Um, <clears throat> I, I think we don't know enough about that because that we don't do an, uh, we don't do a lot of repeat biopsies. So if you don't look for something, you don't find it. Um, but um, but I think, you know, getting to one of the questions earlier, I think in general this issue of tumors being heterogeneous is going to be an uh, emerging question. So um, as we start looking at differences of metastatic and primary tumors or your tumors before and after therapy, we'll start finding differences in within that. I'm sure we'll find some patients that we might have missed or her to in positivity either because we looked in the wrong space or things change over time. Hey, thank you. Another question online is uh, there's a gastric cancer stage four with peritoneal involvement. And the question is, what is the recent opinion on the HIPAC treatment for gastric carcinoma with this peritoneal involvement? So uh, I, can, I can take on oh, sure. that yeah. one. <laughs> Because uh, I, I get asked that uh, quite a bit, and the um, uh, the question has to do with something called heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy, where uh, we do an operation to try to remove as much of the tumor as possible, and then in the operating room um, uh, add a heated chemotherapy to try to destroy any of the other microscopic tumor left behind. There is a role for that process in some other cancers, and so it's been tried in gastric cancer as well. And unfortunately, the results really have been very poor. In fact, uh, most of the results would suggest that the patients who go through that procedure actually end up uh, causing or shortening their life just because of the potential complications are pretty dramatic from it. Uh, there, there, uh, there's at least one phase two trial uh, going on now in this country readdressing that issue in gastric cancer. But to date, we really can't recommend it as a standard treatment. We have another question online that has been asked um, a lot. Why and when do doctors consider restaging cancer? We're, we're always restaging the cancer. So, um, I mean, you, you, you're, you're kind of the stage that you start with. So, so it's not like your cancer, your disease status may change, but the stage of the cancer doesn't really change. So we do staging initially to decide whether we should do surgery alone, whether we should do surgery plus chemotherapy or radiation, whether we should do chemotherapy alone. And then in terms of reevaluating the cancer, that's a continuous process. And that would include uh, imaging, usually a CAT scan, and if appropriate, getting periodic endoscopies. But we're, we're constantly reevaluating patients, but uh, your, the stage doesn't change. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. We actually have quite a few questions that are came online, but I don't think in the interest of time, we don't have time, and we will try to um, get some um, answers to your questions online. But um, I just, I'm going to go up to the podium here. And I hope you found this session um, very useful to you. I'd like to thank our, you know, your time to come out for the whole day to hear this wonderful panel of speakers. I mean, these are the most renowned doctors, scientists in, in the world who have come to um, you know, give up their time um, so you can get some questions answered and give you some, some um, information. Um, thank you so much. I want to remind you that tonight that we do have a gala, so please come. And I'd like to thank all of our supporters who um, gave support for this wonderful educational event. And hopefully we will see you at some of our events that are coming up. And also would love to see you again next year when we bring up some um, new topics as well. So thank you very much for your time. Good luck and good health. Thank you.